On September 14th, 2010, exactly 10 years ago, Halo Reach was released to the Halo community. While many praise the successes of this game, many others cringe at its failures. So in this video, where I go into all the details about what makes Halo Reach such a divisive game within the Halo community. How's it going everybody? It's Kevin here once again giving you another video about Halo. Today we're doing the 10 years after review of Halo Reach. If you guys like these kind of analytical review kind of videos, please make sure to tap that like button. It lets me know you want to see some more content like this. Helps the YouTube algorithm so more people get a chance to recognize what Halo Reach is all about. So when it comes to talking about Halo Reach as a whole, there are multiple aspects of where it succeeded and where it kind of failed a bit. And I also want to go into a bit of what went around this game as well. So I'm going to touch on seven different kinds of points about Halo Reach. We're going to be talking about the era of when it released back in 2010. It's certainly different than it is nowadays. Days. the general tone of the game. Of course, we're going to be talking about the campaign, the multiplayer, the Forge, the theater, and also with its release on PC recently, just less than a year ago from the making of this video. So let's get right into it. Coming off the widely held successes of Halo 3 and ODST, Bungie had to come in with another title to finish out their contract with Microsoft. So this was supposed to be their swan song of a video game, the last one that they would make of Halo. So I'm sure they wanted to go out with a bit of a bang. Interesting direction they had to go with is that Halo 3's story was completed. They went with a side story with ODST, but now you're making another mainline Halo game. So, where are you gonna take this story? Knowing the time frame of when this game releases helps you kind of give you an idea of the decisions that they make throughout this whole thing. Like, how do you make another blockbuster game after Halo 3, and especially how it, the story just ended really perfectly, really, for the franchise? And how do you continue on that with a con convincing and interesting story? Well, Bungie set out to do just that. I think a going will go without mention that a major part that I think they've actually played a certain part within Halo Reach's development is the fact of Call of Duty's rise of popularity was peak during that time. Black Ops 1 released during that time, which was my favorite Call of Duty at the time. Uh, but basically from the years of 2007 to 2012 are basically like the heydays of Call of Duty, the rise of popularity that we haven't seen since small Fortnite success. Where in Call of Duty, they put a big emphasis on the character themselves, customization and additions, how you can modify your gameplay to your play style how you would like. And I think that following those kind of trends, which later represent replicated throughout the entire shooter genre replicated into Halo as well with armor abilities, but we'll get into that later. Also back then, those were the days when you just pay $60 for a game and well, you got the entire thing and all you had to do was just pay for map packs after that. Simpler times then. So the second part I want to talk about is tone. Obviously the tone of this game is widely different than any other Halo game that we've played really before and after. The game had a much darker tone to it, much more somber and had a bit of a feeling of success, but at what cost kind of feeling, which is something we never really had before in Halo, where before it's all just, you see the mission, you accomplish it, you're the hero of the day. And to match these darker, somber tones, they kind of did that with the color palette as well, making it more gritty. Uh, I'd say probably a little bit more realistic as Previously, Halo was a much more vibrant color palette. They went with more, more grays, uh, more, more muted as well with, with its coloring as well. And at some points, even a little washed out, especially on the mission like Tip of the Spear, which kind of washes out the color, makes it a little bit more muted, which kind of fits the tone of the game and story itself. So I think on that side, that's kind of why they chose the decisions that they made moving forward with the actual game development. Number three here, we have to talk about the campaign. Obviously a major seller back then were campaigns. You had to have a good campaign for for people to buy your game. It gave you a reason why to put different kind of uh, equipments and themes within the multiplayer was through the campaign. And Halo Reach did some really great things within the campaign as well as bringing a lot more of your customization that you have for your character with Noble Six as being kind of a blank slate kind of character to put yourself in the shoes of. I really love the feature with being able to have your custom Spartan in the campaign. It's something that I've always wished we've had in later Halos, but we really haven't had a chance to really thematically put it in yet when you play as Master Chief, obviously. I would say that the gameplay itself of the campaign is fantastic. It's probably the most realized campaign I've ever seen Bungie play. And what I mean by that is obviously we all know the hellish development of Halo 2. Uh, Halo 1's was a very rudimentary basic kind of story because they just had to get the, you know, the basic systems of the game down, you know. But uh, Halo 3 was pretty well done. There was a lot of backtracking though when you think about it. Oftentimes, as soon as you play through the mission, you have to play the same mission again, but just backwards. It gets a little repetitive. 
competitive at times. And in Halo Reach, I think they kind of took that criticism, which I know it was a serious criticism back in the day of a lot of backtracking in Halo 3. They implemented that in Halo Reach. You don't really backtrack, if at all, really, in the campaign. And so each mission provides its new kind of gameplay element, new story element, new themes, new arenas to fight in. And it just really just takes you through the whole campaign you don't feel like you're dragging through it it's very well paced the gameplay is fantastic and does have some slight callbacks to ce era days as well and i feel like this was a campaign that they really found their way to make perfectly and they was executed very well obviously this is just from a user end of things i'm not quite no one really knows exactly how the development worked in halo reach how much cut content there was or how much stuff was left on the cutting room floor uh, but I just feel like this campaign was just like the most fully realized campaign that Bungie ever put together. Though obviously you had to talk about the story because you have to have a story with campaign gameplay obviously and the story I will have to admit was a little bland as they tried making a case that this is a character driven story with all these different new characters that you have to follow along with and the problem with having so many mainline characters like George, Emil, Kat, Carter, Noble Six even. Each character needs a little bit of screen time so you get the chance to know them and connect with them but obviously having so many mainline characters it kind of robs you of that time to really connect with these people so you're kind of just like a superficial love of like yes Carter you are the captain I will follow George you had that one time where you showed some compassion so I like you man Emil you had the couple times where you showed as a badass so you're pretty cool as well but did you really care about these characters? I wouldn't really say so. Certainly not like how you care for Master Chief or Cortana, especially at the end of Halo 4. That's a tearjerker right there. But I also do believe that the general idea of having a prequel to CE is a really cool idea as well. As so we're kind of just thrown into the middle of this conflict between the humans and the Covenant and having just a little bit more backstory about how things came to be within the 1 through 3 trilogy uh, is a really great aspect. It's really cool. I just think the campaign is super fun. I just kind of wish the characters were a little, had a little more time to kind of develop. But other than that, like, it's a great campaign. Now, what is Halo without multiplayer? Well, it's not truly Halo. And for the multiplayer of Halo Reach, Bungie did not hold back when it comes to customization and ability to play what you want and how you want to play it in this game. Now, one of the shining gems of this entire game is your Spartan customization. They saw how much people loved customizing their Spartans back in Halo 3, which is very rudimentary, and they just doubled down on that being able to obviously upgrade your helmet with different variations of the helmet upgrade different uh, kind of customizations for your shoulder pieces your wrists your legs your chest pieces and then on top of that I have an extra color customization as well that it was truly very hard to find a Spartan that looked like your Spartan within the matchmaking world. 343 actually recognizes the love that the community has for Halo Reach's customization, so they're saying that if you like Halo Reach's customization, you'll definitely like Infinite's. Obviously with some awesome customization, you have some great gear to go along with it, and one way to get yourself some awesome in-life gear is by checking out Loot Crate. Loot Crate is kind of like a fun bi-monthly mystery box that gets sent to your house that has different kinds of fun little gadgets and gears that you would like to have for yourself. Previously, Halo actually partnered with Loot Crate to have the legendary Loot Crate. We had some awesome, cool content from that, but there's so much more than just Halo stuff. They have crates for gaming specifically, like gaming in general, Destiny, Fallout, Elder Scrolls, so much more different things for movies, like Marvel movies, Rick and Morty, WWE. They have just general sci-fi, clothing wear, anime stuff as well if you're into that kind of thing, and also Harry Potter. Loot Crate recently sent me a box with some just general gaming goodies. It was pretty fun to check out. Again, guys, if you want to get some awesome gear, check out the link in the description down below. Make sure to use the code KEVIN15 for 15% off your purchase. Plus, it really helps support this channel. This Halo game was also the first one to implement different psych profiles when it comes to matchmaking, as you can set your psych profiles and match similar players using those similar settings, but hopefully you find the game kind of play that you like. Personally, I didn't really use these a whole lot, and I don't think a whole lot of other people did either, as they weren't really uh, described perfectly well within the game to truly understand how this worked. Though, it was the first time we gave players options when it comes to their matchmaking experiences, which you know, didn't really come back around until about Halo 5. Obviously, talk about multiplayer, you have to talk about the signature mode, Invasion. This was a new mode that was brought in the Halo Reach and the only time it was ever in the game. And back then, I never really played it a whole lot. I was more into my social Slayer experience and that's kind of all I really played back then. Luckily, when the game released on PC, I jumped into playing more Invasion and I did not realize how much fun I was going to have with Invasion. Now, I'm, it's a game mode I'm wishing that 
has been in every Halo ever since. Uh, because I think the greatest thing about this game is that it really has three different types of modes within one game mode, which is so cool. Attack and defense mode, which I've always liked those kind of modes as well. As a big fan of Battlefield Rush game mode, this kind of scratches that itch when it comes to uh, playing that same kind of mode, but in Halo. I think it's a really cool thing what they did is that they made the Spartans and the Elites anatomically correct, as in basically with Halo 2 and Halo 3, they had to make the Elites about the same size roughly uh, and same hitboxes roughly as a Spartan but just because of balance and things like that. Though with Invasion being an attack defense kind of thing, you can have advantages and disadvantages that kind of balance each other out and that's exactly what they did with Invasion with the Elites being proper size to lore when it comes to the game. So you have these towering multiplayer characters coming around at you as a Spartan. You feel kind of like a dwarf. You feel like you're going to get your butt kicked by these guys. So they're a little intimidating just on a visual standpoint. And I think it's really cool that you kind of accentuate that difference between the two sides. And if there was any game mode I wish would come back into Halo Infinite, it would be Invasion. Now, a bit of controversy when it comes to the multiplayer for Halo Reach is the ranking system that they utilize within this game. They threw out the classic 1 through 50 to do for different kind of tiers and a point system, essentially. Utilizing this ranking system in the Team Arena playlist, which I actually ended up playing a little bit towards the end of Halo Reach's lifespan, and it was actually really freaking fun. I liked it a lot. I thought it was a really cool change. You know, obviously, I know a lot of people love the 1 through 50, Personally, I, to me, it's just a number, uh, but the way they worked the algorithm to calculate your skill within a game was very cool. How they calculated uh, you know, your personal performance, not just wins and losses like the previous Halo games. And you also got a boost of score when it came to your wins as well. So ultimately, it was about winning. Winning will give you a big bonus when it comes to ranking up, but it also takes into consideration your personal ability. So then you can still rank up. Even if you had a good game, but you lost, you can still rank up. And that's something that re has really been missing in recent Halos. I know they tried doing that in Halo 5, though a lot of people still like the classic 1 through 50 system. It's a lot simpler. It's easier to understand. You know, you win, you go up, you lose, you go down. Pretty straightforward. And how much of a team-based game Halo has always been that it really kind of removes a little bit of the team ability and puts more emphasis on the individual. I can see that reasoning. Though obviously when you're solo queuing, which many people do when it comes to ranked games, you need to show some way of personal skill within each game rather than just wins and losses. So I actually really like the ranking system in Halo Reach and how they went about doing it. Uh, though I can see how people had their own issues with it. Now for your more social boys, this is something that's gonna be very polarizing, armor abilities. This was a new gameplay element added in the Halo Reach that a lot of people did not really like. It was the first Halo game to feature Sprint, which became a much more common feature in within other shooters. Had other abilities like a drop shield, like a bubble shield, armor locker, obviously, which a lot of people are not big fans of, camo as well. Uh, it just really kind of removed a lot of different things that were previously skill-based things, like saying you need an overshield, you go pick it up so you can utilize it rather than just pressing X whenever you need it. Same thing with camo that was removed and so then you had on your character and it just kind of added a bit more randomness to the gameplay which obviously in your shooter that's kind of like the cardinal sin if if you're dying by random causes it really makes the game not fun because you feel like you were not outplayed, they were just out tricked or just cheesed really in a way. Even the MLG settings took a while to try to figure out the sweet spot with the armor abilities while they did have them for a while there as a pickup in the game, though it uh, ended up just kind of getting taken out overall with the competitive settings. And I cannot tell you how many nights I have raged over armor lock. Oh my God, the armor lock made me, used to make me so freaking mad. Obviously, if you're talking about multiplayer, you're gonna be talking about the guns you're gonna be using in it. And a, there are a lot of new guns in this game, but a different kind of tech that they used with it. Obviously, they threw out the battle rifle in this game. So just like they did with ODST, they took out the battle rifle and they replaced it with the DMR, which honestly, I kind of like the DMR. It's a cool weapon. Uh, it was the first of its kind within the Halo franchise. So it was a you know, welcome addition. It fills the role of the BR the exact same way, pretty much, uh, with just a little bit extended range to it. So I think it doesn't really feel like Halo Reach is missing a battle rifle. Uh, I think that the DMR does a great job of filling that in. Though, what they decided to do though, is bump up the bullet velocity to the point where it's essentially hit scan. That would be kind of a tricky issue because obviously you can't be cross mapping people with these semi sniper rifles like a DMR. Like you see, like when you're playing on Hemorrhage, which is the remake of Blood Gulch, that gameplay really shows uh, the difference between hit, hit sit scan and also projectile weaponry. And so they implemented Bloom. Bloom 
It's a very controversial topic. I honestly don't find Bloom that bad, as oftentimes if you just pay, learn how to pace your shots properly, you can still get kills. Though again, this adds in a bit of randomness, like we were talking about with the armor abilities with Halo Reach when it comes to the gunplay itself as well, where sometimes you can just spam away and you'll get a lucky kill shot rather than actually meaning to do that. Uh, I did, would say I do like the TU settings, which are an 80% Bloom, so it's 20% less than what it was. I think that's kind of the sweet spot, especially it makes some other weapons like the needle rifle really stand out within the sandbox and become something much more unique and almost like a power weapon really. So Bloom was put in to help balance out the difference between hit scan and projectile with so you don't have just laser beams going across the map, uh, though it did add that element of randomness to the game, which obviously ending randomness like we've talked about previously just kind of enrages people. So it's it, I understand the design of it, but I don't really agree with the implementation of it. Now, if you're talking about a Halo game post Halo 3, you have to be talking about Forge as well, as Forge has always been a major content driver when it comes to playing this game. There are some people within the Halo community who just Forge. Like, they don't really even bother playing that much multiplayer. They just love creating things within this game, and not very many other games out there give their community the tools to do that kind of stuff. When Bungie initially brought in Forge in Halo 3, they thought it'd just be kind of like a fun, like, party mode, like, switch up some spawns. You'd be like, oh, you want this weapon here? Sure, why not? Uh, put a box there, why not? They didn't think that they'd actually create maps using these tools, but they ended up doing that and Bungie recognized it and they definitely doubled down with us making Forge World the largest Forge canvas I think still ever within a Halo franchise, which is kind of crazy to think about. Not only that, it came with some awesome new features like phasing, which previously in Halo 3 you had to do some really wonky saving and ending the game, coming back in the game, moving things around and then you know restarting the round kind of stuff. That was fixed, now she just phased into the ground, so it made melding of objects so much easier, uh, using coordinates as well to have much more exact measurements when it comes to placing your objects down, and just more objects, more things to create with, obviously, is just, well, flat out better. Uh, my only critique would be is that I think Bungie really kind of relied on the community to create more content for this game. The launch of Halo Reach had probably one of the lowest map pools we've ever seen within a Halo game, but I think it's because they wanted to highlight Forge more and have more people create using that tool so it kind of helped let the community sustain the game a little bit longer. But the thing is that it kind of comes back to the multiplayer is that you can never truly replace Forge maps for developer made maps as we've seen with Halo 5 and that BTB mode. It just doesn't have the same kind of feel as a developer made BTB map. Same thing with the launch of Halo Reach and Halo Reach's lifespan throughout. Uh, the color palette within the Forge is very gray, uh, very blocky as well. And so then a lot of the maps end up kind of looking the same if you're not playing like an outdoor area. Area. Overall, Forge was a fantastic expansion of a feature that was in Halo 3, uh, though I do feel like Bungie relied on it a little too much when it comes to the sustainability of Halo Reach. And of course, we have to talk about another feature, Theater. Theater is such an awesome feature to be in a Halo game, and just any any video game really, just in general, as it helps you create more clips, more content for people to check out and watch, you can share online and things like that. But you have some like iconic screenshots, some insane clips, and just helps you record your gameplay. Obviously, this is back in 2010, which I think, you know, Facebook was just starting out really back then. Uh, this is also back when uh, commentaries on YouTube became starting to become popular. As so you, Austin, you would use the theater mode to go back and record your good games. Not a whole lot was changed when it came to the theater or the uh, features attached to it, like sharing and file shares and things like that. And it all kind of rather stayed the same because, well, it worked out pretty well back in Halo 3. And that brings us now to the current day of Halo Reach on PC. Being able to relive this game again on the platform I prefer at a higher frame rate, higher resolution, without that weird motion blur thing that was on the console to help kind of blend some of the jaggy edges when it comes to the graphics. They really pushed the 360 when it came to this game. Being able to truly get a chance to experience it in such high fidelity, it's just an amazing experience to play. Obviously when it came to PC though, there was no theater, there was no way to file share, there was no forge either. Playing the game above 60 frames was just really framey and just not a good experience, which still is to the day of the making this video. I feel like the launch of Halo Reach on PC was very bare bones. I think they had to just kind of get it out when they could with the announcement being back in March and then the game finally releasing in December. I think it was just kind of like they just had to push it out because they took too long to develop it honestly. Though on the MCC for PC version, Halo Reach still 
ends up being one of the more popular games that I play. I'd probably say it's the second most popular game on the collection, just behind Halo 3 on PC when it comes to finding games. And the funny thing is, like, I really had my issues with Reach back in the day. You know, it kind of triggered me a lot playing this game. But now playing it again on PC, I'm finding myself really enjoying the game for some reason. Uh, I don't know if it's just nostalgia, kind of got wiped away, and now I just kind of take it in as a new experience. Or maybe the things that pissed me off back in the day don't make me so mad anymore. So that is Halo Reach in a nutshell. A very major turning point within the franchise that took it from its classic roots into a more modern era. And ever since Halo Reach, They've been trying to add these more modern elements while also maintaining the classic feels of Halo. It's a very tough balance to make, and it looks like that's what 343 is trying to do with Halo Infinite as well. Some things are going to have to be added, some things are going to have to be cut to make the gameplay work well for itself. We'll just have to wait and see as the news and information pours out for Halo Infinite. But let me know in the comment section down below, guys, what are your thoughts on Halo Reach? Do you overall like this game? Is it your favorite? Is it your least favorite? Let me know in the comments. I do read all of them and try to reply to most of them as well. If you guys like these kind of videos, Make sure to tap that like button. Let me know if you want to see more content like this. Check out the videos on the screen right over here if you missed any content from me or you've been out of the loop for news in the last few days or so. Thank you so much for watching. I'll catch you on the next one. Peace out.